So, so today I want to do two things. First, I want to go back to the, the equation we you know, looked at last time, uh, this equation that made no sense, and then I'll give it a meaning through large deviation. That's one. And then that I'll try to do that first half of the class. And then second half of the class, I'll discuss an application of this so that you know, it's not all dry formula. And the application will be a MIPS, which is motility induced phase separation. Okay. So first let me remind you a little bit of what we did last time. So we looked at the system of interacting particles that satisfy an SDE of this type. Where you have so a drift term that's composed of something which depends only on the particle and something which is a pairwise interaction between particles. And then we put a little bit of noise. Actually, not a little bit, because the noise is not small. And this was for i equals, so there's n particles. OK? n interacting particles. And I'm writing this as if it were li like the mathematicians do. But you remember that this really is the same, so I'll just write it here. I mean, physicists would write this equation as being B of xi plus 1 over n, sum over j equal 1 to n. So that, that part would be the same. But here they would typically write something which is like that, with an eta i, right? And then I'll write it below the, this. The, the, you know, the connection is that in this line, you would think that eta i of t and that j of t prime, the expectation of that is delta of t, all the deltas, like right, delta i j, and then the identity matrix. Right? This, these guys take value in R D, this j particle moving in R D. If you think about this this way, well mathematician typically write something just like this, which they call quadratic variation, but that really means the same. Uh, which is that they write that as being delta e i j, the identity times dt, OK? And then there's one more thing maybe that's, you know, let, let me write all of that, which is that this guy is, is a winner process. And so if you look at this, t prime, and you take the expectation of that, that's uh, delta i j, the identity, and then it's the minimum between t and t prime. And in fact, you can think about eta as being this eta as being wj prime. This guy here is w dot, the derivative, the time derivative. Of course, this guy doesn't exist, so that's why mathematicians don't like this, and they write these things. But this is all equivalent, OK? okay. Now, um, if you look at this equation, right, I told you that what, what we looked at last time is that in order to analyze it, we introduce this rho n of Tx, which is the empirical density. So you take a point x, right? and I'm using the same convention as last time. This, guy, this is the one that depends on time. That's the solution of this equation. right? And then you make the average. So this is the average density, if you wish. But the average is taken over particles. There's no expectation. right? And, and when you do that, somehow you ask whether there's a particle at a given location. You don't care which particle there is. So there's some form of coarse grading between these two things. But it so happened that because this equation here right, is such that the identity of the particle can be interchanged, right? you can write down an equation with dt rho n. And I wrote that. So there were two statements that I made last time. I told you that. So if you take as initial condition here xi of 0 to be all i i d distributed, that's what this means, with respect to a certain rho 0. OK, so this is the initial. So you draw the particle randomly, independent. You could do other things, as, as Julio pointed out, but you draw them all independently from a given density. It's a given PDF, probability density function. right? Then the statement that we made was that rho n converges to a certain rho as t goes to, uh, as n goes to infinity, sorry. Right. Then is that as n goes to infinity, this guy converts to a term rho. It's a function of time and, and x. 
And this quantity satisfies this equation. Let me write it down one more time. You can write it like this. Let me write, then explain. Uh, like that. Uh, plus sigma squared over 2 times the Laplacian of rho. And you need to solve this equation with at an initial condition, which is that this is rho 0. This, fun this, this is a function of x, right? And so these are also a function of x. Okay? And v here is uh, simply the, actually, this minus, and is the b of x plus the integral of b of x y rho of y dy. And I'm using this little bracket here to remind you that this is, this is a function of x, it's a functional of rho, which is what this line is actually writing. Okay? And in some sense, you can think about what's happening. Right? This is called, so this, is, this statement is a law of large number, but it's also referred to as mean field limit. It's also referred to as a propagation of chaos. Right? This equation is the Mac, you know, uh, mckeen vlasov equation. And if you think about what it actually says, it says, well, uh, in this equation, I'm making here an average over the particles, okay? And I can, rep I mean, which I can replace with respect to the average of this density. And then if you write down the equation, you remember, what happens is that uh, to leading all, this is what you get. And then there's one more term that depends on n. And you just say that one disappears in the limit when n goes to infinity. This is weak convergence, right? Yes, so this little arrow, but we're not going to dwell on anything like that. This is okay. Because <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm getting used to the arrow of the wind. So <laughs> <laughs> this is weak. So that means that if you test that any, against any test function, you integrate, that converge to that right, to any test function. Okay? Like that. Right, that's my key plus. Okay. So that's pretty much where we were. And then I told you that, in fact, let me erase the initial condition. Where should I put the initial condition? I'll put the initial condition below. There is that. And you know we want to have that rho at time t equals 0 is rho 0. So these are the two conditions that we need to have. And then I told you that um, you can add it. I mean, formally, there was one more term in this equation that account for the noise, right? which is there was a term which was that 1 over square root of n, like sigma. Right? And then there was the gradient of the square root of rho, and then an eta tx, where this is a spatial temporal white noise. White noise. Okay? And, and I told you, well, the problem with this. So this equation is supposed, that one, that one is sometimes called, in fact, it is called Dean's equation. Because it was derived by Dean not so long ago. And I told you that the pr so this equation, in fact, if you write it down, is like an exact re rewriting of this guy at that level. So it's really meant to be an equation. It's not like not taking the limit. That's what you get. So looks great. Except that you can't give a meaning to that term, so you still need to take limit at some point. Okay, that's what I want to do today. Right? So let me repeat that. If you just use chain rule and Ito formula, you can essentially start with this SDE and write an SDE for this guy. And if you write what it is, it looks like it should be something like that. But the noise in this equation is very rough, and rho, after all, is a distribution. You need to take the square root. There's many things that you don't want to do. So we want to give a meaning to this equation slightly different. Okay. Now, it's useful to have this equation because it turns out that somehow, if you were to use this equation as an intermediate step, you say, even though it doesn't make sense, I'll just believe in it anyway. And I'll try to derive things from it, like, for example, a law of large number, taking the limit. Well, actually, you get the right one because you drop just that term. CLT, which is to try to happen, if you account for quotation, you get the right thing. And even large deviation principle, you get the right thing if you start from this equation. But I'm not going to do that this way because that's like you know using an intermediate step with an object that's no meaning. So it's a bit, it's, you know, you turns out that you recover at the end and you get the right answer, but it's not going to be your y. So I'll do that slightly differently. Okay. So in order to do that differently, so what we're going to do is I need so 
this equation defines a stochastic process, right? And so you know that if you have a stochastic process like that, the diffuse is called a diffusion. You can write down a Fokker-Planck equation associated with that, with an operator which is generated, right? You can do the same thing at this level. So let me, let me write that and explain again. It's a bit, as usual, it's a bit of you know, a mouthful of notation. So, we, so what I'm going to try to do this, to do here, is to reproduce at this level something that we already did at this level, if there was only one particle, actually. And what that is, is I'm going to write down the backward Kolmogorov equation. So let me explain how we do that. The idea is that you, so you introduce a functional. So let's introduce a functional phi, which is a functional of rho. So of rho n, which is the rho n of t. That's this guy, if these guys satisfy that. Let me give you an example. You could, for, I mean, this one will be interesting later. You could, for example, take phi of rho n t to be, we're going to use something like that later, the, the, expectation, uh, the exponential of the integral over the domain of a function theta of x, some given function, right, the test function again, and then rho n t x dx. With this, with this guy, you see what I've written here, if you use what is the definition of uh, rho n, is nothing but 1 over n, the sum from j equal or i equal to n, sorry, I changed, theta of x j. Okay? It's, so, viewed from this, it looks like it's a function of the x i, but viewed this way, it's a functional of rho n. Hence the little bracket that's there. Okay, and then what I can do is the game that we played with the one particle before. Then I can look at what is the expectation here if I start with rho n of zero equal rho zero, conditional on that. What does that mean? Is in, I take the expectation of, for example, this functional. If these guys here, which are the ones that depend on time, as initial condition for them, I draw them independently with respect to rho zero. And this rho zero is the guy that's there. Okay? Are we? Okay. And then you can write down an equation. So this, no, this object, and this is the place where, like, you know, a bit of, this object def defines a function, or a functional, I will define, so it defines this, right? Which is a function of t and the rho zero, but it's a functional of rho zero. Because there's two things that I can vary here, right? One is the time, when do I evaluate that? And the second thing that I can vary is what's the rho zero that I use to draw my initial condition? Okay, I have a two parameter. One is a function, one is a density, so it's a big set of parameters, the other one is time. Okay? And it so happened that it only depends on rho zero. So again, because, of, because the particle here are undistinguishable, and I draw them all with the same initial condition, it turns out that this is not a function of the individual initial condition of the particles, which is what you might think, it, but it's only a function of rho zero. Okay? And then you can write down an equation for u, which is this backward Kolmogorov equation. It's a uh, backward Kolmogorov equation. So what I'm going to write this equation, no? So what, what does it say? It says, well, the dt of u. And I'm going to write, so to, to drop, because now I'm writing that as an equation of rho. When I go from this line to this line, I'll just drop the 0 to not have too many indices. OK, so but it's the same. You know, th this is a dummy variable, right? Here, I, I, I wrote it as rho 0 to make to insist on the fact was initial condition, but it's a, it's a dummy variable where, where you can evaluate the functional. So on this line, I'll just use rho for this, you know, this, this dummy variable to not have too many indices. And so what is this equation? Well, this equation can be written like that. So <clears throat> this backward Tomorrow equation here now becomes a functional equation, right? It's in fact the functional equivalent to the backward equation that you could write to the diffusion equation that you could write for this. Let me write it down. It's uh, OK, 
Okay, so it's uh, no, V of x rho times the gradient, so like that, of the functional derivative of u over rho of x. That's one term. And then there is another term, which is <coughs> so this is integrated over x, this is integrated over x, okay, these are functions, and then there's one more term, which is this guy, which is, um, oh, for, uh, no, I forgot, there is a, I forgot that there is a row here, and there is a row there, like that. So, so oh, all, those oh. all those rows now are... The dummy variable. Uh, that yes. Yeah, let me finish the equation so that I don't lose track, and then, and then yes, I'll, I'll, I'll answer the equation. So there are, these guys are evaluated at x. Maybe I should make it a little bit. This is a function of x. There is a Laplacian. This guy is the one that is evaluated at x, and then this guy here is like this. So, so the, the u on this side, I, I don't, I didn't write the argument. It's the same, okay? Right. And your question was yes. W w w w the, yeah. So this, I, this is the same rule. It's a dummy variable. It's yeah. a, you know, it's you like mean, a resolution at some time. Uh, of the yeah, and this, right? Exactly. And the, the initial condition for this is just the one that you get here, which is that you know what this function is at initial time. So maybe let's write it below. It's that u at time t equals zero of rho. Well, it's just the initial, you know, is the, the phi that I took initially. At that time, I know what it is because no, nothing has evolved. So it's the one that needs to evaluate on the initial condition. And then it evolves according to this. Okay? This so if you look at this equation, right? It's, you can see that there is a part which is like there's a second, there's a first order that it's the drift, right? I have written it with the derivative on, on the good side. And, and, and then is, there is one more term. This guy, in fact, I could put a little red box around it because this guy, this guy here is what I count for the noise. Why? Because, you know, if you think about, right, if you were to write down here the focke planck equation, you'd get derivative with respect to x. And the one, that involve these guys would be one derivative with respect to x because the drift, but this one would induce the second order derivative with respect to x, d x squared, d over d squared x squared. At this level, it's sort of the same thing, but they've moved from by particles to something which involves no the density, and that's the equation that you can write down. Okay, except that I have forgotten something, which is that, and that's important. There's an n here. That n is that n. Hmm. Right, the noise is on, you know, is on a slightly other scale. Okay. Now, okay. So this, this, so believe it or not, this equation actually can be given a meaning, even though it's 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 an active area of research. In fact, to, to try to understand it. For, for the reason that is this, you can the operator that is on the, the right hand side, you can define. There's no problem if you have the right classes of functional u. Now. What you want to show is that you can extend this so that you can that is solution to this equation. We're not going to dwell with this because I'm just going to use that, right, as a, as a tool to in fact derive the law of large number and the C, the, the, the the LDP. And it's going to be actually quite simple, which is well. <clears throat> suppose I take n going to infinity here. Then again, this term disappears. And if I look at the part that remains, this is just the generator of this equation without the red. In other words, if you look, we did that, so we did that already. If you look at the character, if you, you know, it's a first order equation. If you want to solve it by the method of characteristics, that's the, the, that's the characteristics equation. Okay? The question is what happens if you put the n here? And so, in order to do that, 
right? Okay, so there's two things you could do. You could do you could do CLT. You could go one level past in the fluctuation, or you can directly do LDP. So let me do LDP. So if you do LDP, what you do is is the following thing. Is that that's why I use that function. I'm going to use the following thing. Is that I'm going to put an n here. And, and which means that I'm going to drop that guy. Because you remember that, so what, what is the, what's the idea that we always try to do to you know, derive this large deviation principle is to say, well, this captures the main behavior of the system. If n is large, you draw your particles, right, according to rho zero. If you were to observe not the detail of what these, these equations do, right, which where you would follow every individual particles, you would just look at what this does, it would satisfy this equation. And you know, that's the, what's that what you would see? You know, if you were to look at that, it would essentially reproduce, this guy would follow closely the solution of this equation. That's the movie I showed you last time, with this flow from one well to another. Okay? So the mean behavior is given by this. In, so, in order to pick up fluctuations at the large deviation level, I need to somehow trick, I need to look at observables, which will be dominated by configuration of the particles that are quite rare or unlikely or infrequent. That doesn't mean that they are not important, and that's going to be the second part of the class. And in order to do that, I'm going to take a functional which makes it clear that the n is appearing, and so something else happens. In fact, it's quite simple. Because if this, if we take this n sets, right, and let me write that here. Uh, if we take this n set there, what you see that it suggests that I could look at the u. I mean, instead of looking at the solution in terms of u t rho, let's define another quantity which will turn out to be the action. Let's look for a solution which is of this type, with an s of t rho. So this defines s. Instead of look, and I did one more parenthesis. It, so since the initial condition is of that type, it is the n that's there, I'm going to try to look for a solution which is of the same type, like this. Okay? And if you, so we did that already once. If you know plug, so let's, if you plug this into the equation that's there, right? Let me, let me write it maybe one time. And, okay, let's, so on, on the left hand side, what you get? On the left hand side, you get this. You get the dt of s is all going to be s of t rho, so I'm not going to write it anymore. And then there's an n in front and an e of n s. That's just taking <laughs> that's just taking the derivative of the exponential, right? And you know you use chain rule and you get that. Now let's look at what happened on the other side. Well, you you know it's a little exercise in in, in terms <coughs> of derivatives here, and you see that this term. It's actually quite simple. What happened is you get an n that comes down, and then you simply get the row of x, the v of x row. And then this guy is dot times ds d row x. And then you have e to the s dx and s. Right? Now, this quantity here, and the same thing, let me write the other one which is sigma squared over 2. Uh, this, that one is the same. There's an n that arises, and then there is um, rho of x, the Laplacian of uh, rho of x, the Laplacian of ds, d rho, e to the n s, dx. There you are this one. Now, you need to remember one thing. These are functional, right? You see, when you, a functional is not a function, I mean, it's a function of rho, there's no, there's no dependency in x here. If you take the functional derivative of it, there is a dependency. Is anyone, let's do a little exercise. Suppose that I tell you that the functional is e to the integral of theta x times rho of x dx. That's not a function of x, right? Because x is integrated over. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. So if I do that, and let's use y as another to, to make the link with what's going on there, maybe I should use x and y in the opposite way. Suppose I do that. This is a dummy integration variable. I could use I could use x on both sides, but let's right, this is a dummy integration variable. I do that, and I do the d over d rho x. What's what's that? 
What's the value here? It's theta of x times e to the integral of theta y rho of y dy. Mm -hmm. right? So that's exactly what I've done there. Okay? This was an explicit one. And here, you know, I, I wrote this guy here is just the functional derivative d over d rho x of the integral of theta y rho of y dy. Right? I have not specified what that guy is. I mean, it was like that initially, but it's no longer like that for the time. But I've still taken this thing. Okay? Now, what does that mean? That means that doesn't depend on x, so I can take that guy out of the integral. Same thing with this one. You see that that means that this n will cancel these ends, and this guy I can cancel these guys. Okay? But, but before we do that, there is one more term here. So let me write what that one is. So that one, okay, so let me write it first. You, you can write it like that. Because I, I'm just doing the functional derivative. And if you do the functional derivative, you get the following thing. Okay, may, maybe I'm going to put this one here. Why well, you cancel again? Wait a minute. You just give me, just give me one second to. S, and then all of this is e to the n s dx. And I, let, let me write it like that. There was an n here, but there's an n squared that comes here, and there's an n there. OK. And why is that? It's because, OK, so, so you're taking like a second derivative of an exponential, and so, well, it gives that. OK? And now, what we can do is we can, here, here we go. Right? I, you see that there's, I can cancel these factors. Up, up, up. And I can cancel the n. Right? And if I cancel the n, what you see is that this one disappears, this one disappears, this one disappears. And then if I divide by n, what do I get? These guys disappear because there is one more n coming from the other side. But this one here becomes 1 over n. Right? Yes? And so if I take the limit of this equation now, and so this is, you know, what I'm explaining to you here is, is the WKB method. Right? This is WKB because it's the WKB n side. So it's WKB. Right? And I mean, I mentioned that one time already. This is the way analysts like to do large deviation. Instead of, they don't look, I mean, the, the probabilists, they typically look at the of formula, right? they make manipulation directly over there. The analysts, they take the backward equation and they do a manipulation over there. And, and what do they say? Well, they say, well, if I take, so I should really write that as an, okay, maybe I'll write one more thing. This is an SN. Okay, okay, there were N everywhere. Let me put with N, N, for a reason that's kind of, okay, N. N, N, and N. Because the statement that you can make now is that S, N converge to S as N goes to infinity. Where what does N, S satisfy? Well, it satisfies the equation without that term. Same idea as what we did when we, we right? You, you, can, you just drop that. Now, of course, you need to justify that that's the right that you can't do that, right? Because it could be that there's something okay, we don't know. But th that's the right answer. And so, and this is a large deviation principle. It tells you this guy converts to that, right? Because the, okay, so this large deviation principle, what you have here on the and I, I'll write okay. Let me first write the equation that you have here, and you can, that one you can write like this. Oh, sorry, I made a mistake here. The, the, it's a it's the backward equation they've written. So it, it's, it's like, I mean, it, this guy equals zero. It's on, on sorry, 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 sorry. It's like this. OK, no, not a big change in your notes. So this equation, you can write like that. Where, so I have written it in the form of what's called an Hamilton-Jacobi equation. It's a functional equation. 
with an Hamiltonian. And what is the Hamiltonian? So I'll write no a bit of man, that's why I use my I'm gonna write it in another way, which is this is a function of two variables that you just read from the line above. And I'm going to use another symbol for this dummy variable here. I'll write it as a theta, because it's going to be useful later. It's a conjugate momentum. And that one is what? It's simply the integral of rho of x, v of x rho, times the gradient of theta x. This is a function of x, right? If I take the, right, the, the, if I take the d over ds of rho x, I get a function of x. And then I have plus uh, sigma squared over 2 times the integral of rho of x and the Laplacian of theta of x dx. And then there's one more term, which in fact I can write on the same line now, which is, sorry, I can write that guy in 2. So theta of x squared dx. Bless you. To go from there to there, I've eliminated that, and I've just rewritten the equation in a way that will be convenient for me in a minute. Okay? Now, this is kind of clear, right? They've just replaced ds d rho by theta, because um, this is what I call it. Same thing here. Uh, wait a minute. S same thing for that guy. And then this one here, right? So, what, what I did, uh, ooh, um, am I, am I, I, I think I'm missing a few terms here. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Sorry. Mm. Sorry. You, you'll hate me for this. Like, uh, it's, this one is just an in space. There was a gradient with respect to x and a gradient with respect to y that was missing there. Mm. Okay. Uh, I know. That's like, you can, I mean, you can squeeze them in, huh? <laughs> space you just I'm sorry there is that right and so th that's why that's why I, I mean that's why I, that's why I use the, the Dirac here Be because see, this is the remnant of the spatial temporal white noise and the reason why I had to write it in this complicated way is because you first need to take the functional derivatives then you need to take the grid in respect to x and y which will eat the with respect to x will only eat the part that comes from here. With respect to y will only eat the part that comes from there. You first do that, and then you please you do the delta. It should be clear to everyone that you cannot integrate this with the delta here and replace all the x by y's. Because otherwise you get one too many derivatives. Okay? So it's like that. But at this level, I I can do explicitly these two derivatives because that one goes on here, that one goes on there. That's all there is. And then I can integrate with respect to that. And what I get is exactly this term. Little bit of algebra. OK? Right. I'm, I'm going quite, fa quite fast, but there's a question answer tonight. So <laughs> <laughs> do you want me to give you question number one? <laughs> okay. So you get that. OK. So there's two things. We're going to analyze this. So now there's two, two comments that needs to be made. This is a large deviation principle. Why? Because what, what, what the statement actually is here is that if you remember what is the definition, what, what we have is that what is SM, right? What we have said is that if you take the expectation with respect to rho n0 is equal to rho 0 of a functional which is of this type, n times S, oh, sorry times s of, uh, wait a minute, I'll, I'll write it, sorry, sorry, it's not what I want, right? Uh, no, sorry, it's just this, excuse me. Uh, right, so this, I mean, I have taken a phi, so to go there, right, okay, so I have taken, okay, so let's, sorry, sorry, I'm, I'm a little bit slow. Probably too much time. <laughs> if you take this, and then you take the log, and then you take 1 over n, 
and you take the limit as n goes to infinity of this, then this guy converts to S. So this is Sn, and it converts to this quantity evaluated at t and rho 0. Let me put the rho 0 again. right? Where now what you need to do is you need to solve the equation that is here with the initial condition that S at time t equals 0 of rho is equal to this phi of rho. That's a function of it. So what is psi of rho? So that's, that's a test function of this type. So in other words, here, I, you know, I told you, you need to fix an initial condition. Here, you were just taking an initial condition, which was arbitrary. And then instead of doing that one, if you take an initial condition, which is of this type, right? This is an initial, so is this line may make that line. If you take an initial condition of this type, right? That says that this guy preserves the same form, so it has a limit as n goes to infinity, which is Sn, which is the one that they have obtained that way. Okay? I should have probably introduced that before, this initial condition, which is that in order to get that this set is true, you need to have it initially. Right? And so, you know, I wanted to have an initial condition like that, and so this initial condition becomes the one that you need to put at the level of the hamilton jacobi equation, which is here. Should I repeat that, or that yeah. was kind of clear? We, we looked at how arbitrary functional evolve. If the initial condition doesn't depend on n, I mean, there was no n at the beginning, right? And then, you know, what, what I did is like this is what I was meant to say with this n there, is that you want to have another initial condition which is of this type, that there's an n that appears there. And if you do that, then if you go through the steps, this is what you obtain. Okay? You can think of phi as being that, except that the rule of theta in these two lines is a bit different. Is that clear? OK. Now let me erase what's in the middle and write you something. Because at the end, what we have shown is just is this. Is that if you take, so it's the same, same interpretation as before. right? Let me repeat it one more time. You know, the algebra we can go through again at another time. I mean, what it essentially says, that's the end of the first thing, you know, is that if I take an exponent, you know, suppose that I take an arbitrary functional of phi, like of this type, and then I take the exp where I evaluate along the trajectory, which is this guy, where the x are the solution of this. If I look at this expectation, that defines a function of t, this t, and rho 0, OK? And I want to ask, what, what, what does this function do? And what it does is that, well, if you take its log, and you take 1 over n of it, it has a limit. And the limit, forget about that, the limit is Sn t rho 0. You can write this depend on rho 0 and on time. So the limit is st rho 0. And this st solves this equation. So that's, the, that's the, the only thing that we need to. Uh, OK? The rest was just derivation. But at the end, you know, the large principle that you obtain is that, where you need to solve this equation with an, it's a final condition. Yeah. OK, let's forget about that. I mean, you, you solve it like this. OK? I messed up initial and final conditions. So there will be something wrong in your notes, and we can discuss that later. Mm -hmm. uh, this, this is at final time that you need to have it here, okay? mm -hmm. uh, as we did before. Mm -hmm. Can I change that? Or is yeah, yeah, yeah. yes. Yes. It's at large t, yeah. which is that this is, this is at large t. It's a final condition. And, and this one here, define what is n at time t equals 0, as we did before. You go backward. You need to solve that equation backward in time. OK? Uh, I mean, you, you know that, because we did that in the other context already. Mm -hmm. And now, this equation is much easier to give it a meaning than the previous one that was there, because this equation you can solve by the middle of characteristics. And what are the characteristics? They are the instant on equation that you have seen, right? the instant on equation. OK, and what are these instanton equations? Well, they, they are just dt rho is equal to the functional derivative of this Hamiltonian with respect to theta, and dt theta is minus the functional derivative of h with respect to rho. So this is a position momentum. 
if you wish. Interpretation of this theta is precisely that. It's the ds over d rho along the characteristics. We did that calculation, so I, so I don't need to repeat it. And if you look at what this is, let's write it down. Okay? This is simply, well, my, so there will be, there are terms that I can, okay, let me write them down. That guy, they are all at, at x, but then there is one more term that's appearing, which is minus sigma square uh, of the Laplacian of rho of x times the Laplacian of theta x. And then this one is, so that one is a little bit more nasty, but I'll write it anyway. Uh, it's when you take the derivative with respect to rho, so you get v of x rho times the gradient of theta x with a minus. Then there is one that is a little bit annoying, which is this guy, and I'm just going to write it, but it's there, it's just d over d rho x of the v. times the gradient of theta x. And then there is the, the, the term that comes from the other guy, which is minus sigma squared over 2 times the gradient of theta squared. So, and this I should really put as y now, because, so this one is x, and this one is, is sorry, this one is y, this one is, let me repeat it. It is actually a little bit more difficult to be focused after the sailing. So this is, if you take the, you know, if you just calculate these two functional derivatives and you will see that that's what that is. Okay? And here you need to solve this equation with rho of t equals 0 equals rho 0, which is the guy that is entering there. And that one you need to solve with the final condition, which is to say that theta at time t, so t equal t, is d phi over d rho. And that's a function of x. That's the one that you read from there. And just a second. So this is a final condition, and this is an initial condition. These are the two instant on equation that need to solve. This one you go forward in time, and this one you go backward in time. And did I, I probably uh, forgot one term here, which is this guy. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. And so now you see that that's why is I, that's why it, no, that's why I I chose this to be a final condition. You better solve this as a backward equation because this is an you see that there's an there's a minus Laplacian here. It's a diffusion equation, but with the diffusion coefficient that's negative. And so it only makes sense if you solve it backward. And it's exactly what you need to do because there's a final condition here and an initial condition there. Okay, so these are the equations that, that you obtain. And if you solve these equations that allow you to, you know, to understand things about rare events or large deviation in these systems. You can also solve this with other, you know, another final condition that you could ask, what happens if at time t, I want this to be a row one, for example. That's trying to find what, so that corresponds to a given theta that you don't know a priori. Right, you could do that. That would tell you what is the most likely way this system of particles will go from a configuration row 0 to a configuration row 1. And now you see the following thing, that if you set theta equals 0 and do this equation, then this is a solution of this guy. And if you set theta equals 0, you drop that term. So you just go back to the, 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 the law of large number equation that was there, the mckeen vlasov right? But theta, even though this theta equals 0 satisfy the equation, it might not satisfy the boundary condition. So in general, it's not a valid, right? It only if, uh, if the final condition is also theta equals 0. If theta is not equal to 0 at final time, well, then theta cannot be equal to 0, OK? And if you think about what that is, and this is also something we discussed before, you can think about the fact that you have replaced, there was an, S, an SPDE here, stochastic partial differential equation, which made no sense, with a noise. 
And but somehow what you know this Dean's equation, you can think about this equation as saying, well, if you want to at the large deviation level, because the noise in this equation is small, in order for it to kind of achieve something, like for example, you know, to go from there to there or there, there is, the noise needs to conspire in a very specific way for this to happen. That's the most likely way, because it's the least unlikely. Everyone is, is like, it's the same thing as doing Laplace method, right, over integral. It's dominated by one path. If you had to do that path integral, it would be that, right? And this one path is the solution of this equation. And if you wish, theta plays the role as the optimal noise, the noise of maximum likelihood. This interpretation is a bit funky, because you can see that it's not the same dimension. But OK, it's, it's the, that idea. It's a control problem. This accounts for the effect of the noise that is to do something very precise to get the guy at the right place at the end. OK? Yes? But I, don't, I don't understand why the last division principle gives us uh, s of 0. I mean, it means not s of e of 0. So that is the solution of this equation. There's a definition. Yeah. Definition. If you define, so like you think about it backward, OK? The backward also, not in time, but in if you look at this equation mm -hmm. with this final condition, think about this problem. Mm -hmm. Okay, I, I read it the other way, but think about this problem. And you want to interpret what is the solution of that equation at times before capital T. Yeah. Well, the interpretation is that in particular at time t equals zero, what it gives you is that. The solution of this equation solved with this final condition give you the value of this limit involving this expectation at time t equals 0. But we have time. I mean, we, have, we are evaluating the observable of which s is uh, the approximation as rho n of t. Does that help? OK. OK. okay sorry. OK. Let me illustrate this. No. First half of the class, how much time do I have? Okay. So this probably went a little bit fast, but if you if you if you have time to, to look at the notes, it's a bit difficult with like all the activities. But <laughs> but but if you if you have time to look at what we did before, we did exactly this in another context. I'm just repeating that we did it with system of particles that were on lattice. This is the off lattice equivalent. But all the steps the WKB, the, you know, the backward equation are exactly the same as before. And in particular, this thing, which is that, you know, you, you get that. Right? And, and you notice that, you know, that's why with this N sets, that this, because the N is there, that you can't, uh, that you bring the noise up, but only in this part and not in that part, which is the essence of the large division principle. Yes? Okay. okay, so let me now specialize this to a, so to a case that we're going to, Discuss. So I'm going to erase that, and then we, we're going to look at something which is MIPS. And there are references, but I mean, the, the, yeah, I'm going to put you more. So I have the, the job box is updated, but I, so I'm going to, you know, I'm going to discuss MIPS, which is motivated <coughs> induced phase separation. And there is a series of paper by Mike Cates and Tyer on this, which don't discuss it the way I'm going to discuss <coughs> it here, because typically they don't look at fluctuation. I, the, what I have posted is a paper with my case and, and uh, Tobias Graf, uh, my case, Tobias Graf, and myself, where we look at fluctuations. That's why I want to discuss. But, but you can look at what that is. So what, what the essence of that is to try to look at particles that are active. So a system which is not in detail balanced in some sense, and then try to show whether the activity can lead to interesting phenomena. And the activity that is there, what is MIPS, is essentially something where particles can bang into one another. They swim. They have a tendency to swim in a specific di direction, li like uh, active rolling and motion. And if they bang into one another, they, ca they can create a traffic jam. And then this traffic jam grows because they can never unjam themselves. Okay. Now, we're going to look at that from a viewpoint which is like a bit of a dumbed-down model of MIPS because it's like uh, some form of mesoscopic model, like an intermediate step. Well, what we're simply going to do is, so I'm going to write an equation. So it's a system, and 
I, I will need to do something which, unfortunately, I, I, my noise was always additive, and now it's going to become multiplicative. But we're going to look at the following thing. We're going to say that dxi is the square root of a diffusion coefficient times dwi for i equal 1 all the way to n. And the only thing that I'm going to assume is that this guy is a function of position through the density of the particle. So d here is a d uh, of rho. It's a function of rho, no, not a functional. We're going to make a specific one. So d of rho will be a d0 times e to the minus rho. That's the one that I'm going to discuss during the class. OK? Hold on. Just give me a second. And the rho n here of tx is 1 over n, the sum from j equal 1 up to n, the same as before, delta of x minus xj of t. There was a question. Uh, okay. Okay. <coughs> Tonight. Okay, so what this is, is simply a model in which there's a diffusion. So this is like a diffusion, right, to a Borean motion. And the only thing that's happening is that the diffusion coefficient depends on the, dens the local density of the particle. And uh, you already understand intuitively wh why you're going to get MIPS from that, or you could is that the particles swim, but if ever, they swim randomly because they all have a diffusion coefficient, but if ever they start to bang into a region right, where the density is low, they are all at D0. But if by chance they kind of go into a region where they kind of make a little cluster, then the density co co coefficient goes down, so they move slower. And then other particles can get in, and once that happens, something it should cause, I mean, this cluster should grow. OK? So you can redo the same thing as what I did. And you get, so I'm just going to write down what is the Hamiltonian in this case. There is no V. There is no V because there is no drift here. Right? But you can write down the equation, and the equation is simply this. I'm just going to write what is the Hamiltonian. So essentially, I, I mean, I need, I, it's, it's this guy, but I change, need to ch you need to change the sigma square into a d of rho. Hold on a second. Just give me a second. So what you end up having here, and I put, so you need to think about this guy, think about this as being a sigma, but now I've made it depending on x, OK? And so if you do that, what you end up having here is the d of rho. Right? It's a d of rho of x okay or tx but I'll make it explicitly so it's not again this is not the function it's a function like this function okay and then you have the Laplacian of theta plus the gradient of theta square dx this equation you should be understanding it in ito so uh, yes it see if you you uh, probably you can uh, we're not going to dwell on this because I have not discussed that. Because the multiplicative noise here, you need to give a meaning to this. You could choose Ito or Stratanovich. In fact, Stratanovich would probably be better because that's the one that's time reversible. Mm -hmm. We're going to do Ito because if you do Ito or Stratanovich, the only thing that changes at this level is that you get a factor one half somewhere. That's, so it's the same at this level. The reason is that uh, you know, the, if you think about what Ito or Stratanovich does, is that there's a correction that appears, right, always. But this correction is proportional to the amplitude of the noise. So drift at the level of large deviation typically doesn't make a difference. E2 or Stratanovich for large deviation typically makes no difference. So it's not completely true, what I say, but this is the equation that you get. So this is the Hamiltonian, OK? And so let me just write down what happened if I write this equation here now with theta equals 0 first, right? So if I just write what is dt rho is equal to this is the functional derivative. I take the derivative and then I evaluate it at, at theta equals 0, just to get the law of large number. Because this gave me the law of large number, right? And so what you end up having is an equation that we already discussed. Now, this is a quadratic term in theta, so it's going to 
go away. And I'm just going to look at this. And so what you end up having is this guy, the Laplacian of the, of, I forgot there is a rho here, which is the, because it's rho sigma rho, right? So what you end up having is the D of rho, rho, this guy. And if you, if you write it, if you expand, you can also write it in this form, the effective uh, of rho times the gradient of rho, where the d effective is equal to uh, the d of rho plus d prime of rho, rho. This is just if you take one of the gradient right there and you, you, you put it there, you get these two terms. Okay? Okay. So you see that this with the specific choice that's there. And that's what we're going to discuss. You get something which is sort of interesting because you get d0 e to the minus rho, 1 minus rho. Because d prime give you that. And so you see that this diffusion coefficient, this effective diffusion coefficient, can be negative if rho is bigger than 1, right? Which is a problem, actually. We're gonna, so we're going we're gonna to have to work on that in a second. But let's think a bit more about this, which is that there's another way to write that equation. Can be than one? That question was already asked at the previous class. So, so I'll answer again. But no, 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 because please. rho is a density. Yeah, you, you, know, actually, you asked. No, it I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 no. It's a density. Yeah, yeah, so it no. needs to integrate to one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But no, no, okay. it can be. I was kidding. <laughs> okay. So. There is another way to think about this equation, which is in fact interesting, which is to try to think about, and we discussed already that a little bit, which is that I can, these two terms here, I, I can, so this is the effect of the noise, if I, you wish, that's the drift, I can write them in detail balance, which is that I can rewrite that equation in the following way. So I'm going to write here because it's, you can write that like this, dt rho is equal to that guy times rho times the d of rho, which is the original one times a gradient, times a functional derivative on an energy over rho at x. So you can write that like that. And I'll leave you at the little exercise that if you take this e of rho, log rho, so they're all at dx. Uh, let, me ma let me write it like that. I, I'm going to leave you as a little exercise that if you do this, they are all rho of x. If you take the functional derivative of this, okay, and you plug into this equation, you're going to get exactly that. I'll skip the derivation of that. It's pure algebra. It, it's, it's, it's interesting. It's what they, they refer to as a thermodynamic mapping. Why? Because it says, this is a non-equilibrium system, but it says that at this level, if I look at this evolution, I can think about the evolution of a landscape. OK, and what is the landscape is the one that's given there. And here I can connect. Do you think that they have been discussing in, in other classes and also in Gilles Tarjus' uh, discussion? This is like a, a, a ginsburg landau type energy, right? And if you look at what it is, the, this part is the end. You no, know, is, is essentially the relative entropy. And this part, let me may, maybe write it in red. These terms, okay, is is what accounts for this part in the D. But then there is one more term that has appeared. And if you do the algebra, you will see that this is what comes out, which is that this guy here is what leads to this. Okay? I'm writing that for this specific form. Okay? 
that's the one that you should uh, that's the one that you should get is for for this guy okay you get that right and that was uh, that was noted by Keats and Taylor but I'm going to make something there was something that we need to look at later so if I look at this okay what you what you have is something which is like that so if I look at the integrand here not the energy the integrand right the energy density Right? And I, I plot it as a function of rho. What you have is that the, this term here, because rho integrate to 1, I just put it for normalization. It doesn't matter that it be there or not. But it's just uh, the convention. If I, there is a term that does that. This is, I'm trying to plot the graph of rho log rho minus rho. It goes like this. Is, right? it, it goes to 0 when rho goes to 0. If rho, if, 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 if rho is less than 1, the, the, the logative, the... Um, uh, uh, the, the, this guy, this guy wins over that because, right? and then, and then it goes like this, and this, okay, so it goes like that, right? And so that tells you that there's a fixed point that's here, in fact, at one. Uh, uh, Sorry, like, you know, the, the graph is like that. Now, if you account for the other term, the green, so this would be, sorry, I should have drawn that in red. That's the one, that's the, that's the red terms. They go like that. But if you look at the other guy, what it does is that it does something which is like this. Because eventually you have this minus rho square that wins. Okay? And so what you can think about this is like, you know, this is a system where there is, a, so I know I don't know anymore how to call that because I don't know if there are metastable states or not. But, but we, are in we are in a finite domain, not, not in three. But there is a state there that's metastable. I'll use that term in the sense that if I were to put a uniform density here, it would remain. But it's unstable against perturbation. Because if ever there's a perturbation that makes that the field dips on this side, then off it goes. And, and that's the remnant at this energy level of what you see with the anti-diffusion there. Okay? And so the, the right way to think about this is that somehow you need to rigorize this problem. One way to rigorize the problem, which, so this I will go quickly because it's not very important is that it's important over there is that you could think instead what's happening here is that the particles fill themselves on a scale which is zero so what you want to do is you want to replace this d of rho not by the bare rho but something that you have modified so if, if instead here of using this guy you were to use a rho say n delta let's write it like that tx which is not this, but it's a modified, but let's, let's write in 2D. It would be e to the minus x minus xj squared divided by 2 delta squared divided by 2 pi delta squared, sum of j equal 1 up to n, 1 over n. Sorry, it's too, probably too small from the back. Let me make myself a bit more space. This is a, you know, the, this is a modified version. Right, so I, I'm, I'm smoothing this guy, I'm smoothing rho n on a scale delta. And so I replace, the, the, I replace the Dirac here by little Gaussian bumps that have scale delta. Okay? If you do that, you can redo the whole exercise. Right? And I'm not going to do that. What happened is that to leaning order of del in delta, you get one more term here. Which is what you get is you get a term which is delta square times the gradient of rho square dx. That's if you rigorize. Okay? And you should know, I, I mean, what I've written here is really no ginsburg landau energy because no, there's an exchange there. There's something that says at some point there's a penalty if you try to have a grade that's too high. Right? That's like the interfacial energy. And, and that is the remnant of what I had here, which is that my particles now, well, they only feel themselves on a scale delta. There is nothing that can happen below delta in a way, and so you get that. This is a, this is to leaning O in delta. It, it, you get something more complicated if if you keep it like that. You need to take a limit at some point. Then you get this energy. Okay, which means that if you think about what this equation here is doing, it's just doing coarse graining, in a way which is this is. The, the, the conservative coarse graining that you have on this, and that's the Canheliat. 
picture of coarse graining, which is, you know, this equation is, is a can Hilliard equation. For those of you who know, if you don't know what that is, it's just it's a standard model by which you can get coarse graining, right? Where what is happening is that you coarse grain the system with this length scale that fix things. So in other words, if you take a system here where you put, you know, a density which is not exactly one, right? in fact, if you're on the part that is there, it will phase separate exactly like oil in water. Coarsening. Coarsening, yes. Coarsening. I mean coarsening, sorry. It will coarsen exactly like oil in water. This is a model for oil in water, except that you have obtained it in another way, which is it's for this swimming uh, bacteria, if you wish, or, or active swimmer. Okay, so you get that. Right? Yes? But, um, the fact that we don't have a ground state in the, in the functional state of the density, I and mean, if we don't consider the term with the ground, uh, is it the problem? Mm -hmm. It, it is, the, it is we, if you remember, like two classes ago, we discussed this particle hopping on a lattice. And, and we say that if there is the same thing, a diffusion coefficient that go down, right? At the lattice level, you know what's going to happen. They will all end up on one side. And what happens if you look at it at that level is that they develop a delta peak somewhere. That's what would happen with this anti-diffusion. You can solve you can solve anti-diffusion for a while, but at some point you get you know a discontinuity, and then you can you stop, right? And here it's just say well you, I can go past that if I regularize, right? So indeed this model you know this model is not I need to have this term included, and, but it's if you could, there is a better way to do this, but which will be much more complicated, is that here you know I only put this diffusion. In fact, I should add a drift here, which is an interaction term between particles to give them a size. Like if, I were, if they were soft particles, right? That if they come too close together, they start repelling themselves. I would have also a regularization, right? So I, I did it in a cheap way. Okay. In fact, when I say I did it, that's it not me. Okay. 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 And so now I'm going to add a little ingredient, and then it, I still have 10 minutes. Okay. So, how much? 20. 20. Okay. So now I'm going to. Uh, so, th there were many, many, many things here. So, you, you know. Yeah. yeah just to be curious, is there, there should be any one, uh, one of them is in front of the new, on the software uh, constraint, uh, row, row N of delta? Which is the sum of the exponential? Yeah, yes, 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 yes. Or it's uh, no, 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 one over n. Okay, okay. I it's just if you if you take that guy mm -hmm. and you you modify it, I mean you you you, you integrate the Gaussian. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what you get. Okay? But it's like a, a softer constraint. Yes. Like mm -hmm. So so now I'm going to do something, which is I'm going to I'm going to add an ingredient. So we are almost done with formulas. All of the rest will be sort of movies. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. I, I guess just a comment about the phenomenology. You've been telling about it like they're swimming bacteria, but this just has a spatially dependent diffusion, right? That's right. So, That's so all that you really need is that the mobility is a function of the density. That's right. That's right. That's, I mean, that's right. But no, that's a good point. Now I'm going to add an ingredient. Okay, which is right now. This is something you can quite do in laboratory. In fact, people do that. Oh, yeah, yeah, so they, they all, you know, something that you know, where you see they, they are more complicated than that typically. They involve uh, active brilliant motion or more complicated things. But I'm going to add an ingredient. That's why they were called bacteria again, not by me, by Mike. Which is that imagine here that the number of particles is not conserved. And so imagine that what I do is that I could do that on we did that on lattice. I'm going to add an ingredient, which is that. The particle can die, and they can reproduce. So they start to look really like bacteria. And what we're going to do is that their rate of death depends, uh, their rate of reproduction depends only on themselves, but their rate of death depends on if it's too crowded, they die. Okay? So they're going to be, you know, if you add, so I'm going to add it here, maybe here. We're going to add a birth death. Okay? Where where they're going to be a carrying you know with a carrying a carrying uh, population row star, okay, which means that 
if what 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 you want to have is that the rate every particle has rate alpha to reproduce but but if if they they die at a rate that depends on the rho zero that's there in fact uh, let me write okay let me write what, what if you do that here's what you obtain there's an additional term here i'll write in another column so you can go through the step and ask yourself if i add an element of stochasticity in this equation, what do I get in the equation that I wrote there? And, well, what you get is the following thing. So, uh, here I probably should take my notes because, to be completely honest, I don't remember if it's that. <coughs> No, it's not that actually. It's that guy, right? It's, ro it's that one. It's just sorry. It's, it's this row square over. <coughs> it's just this. I think I just want to have that. Um, let me give me one second because I don't remember that. Mm -hmm. I need the projection in a second. It's like that. Okay, sorry. Okay. It's like this. So so this is this is a, this is the the reproduction, depends only on rho. Right? But but I put a nonlinearity and I've gone on to my graph. Okay, uh, right. I put a nonlinearity here in the rate of death. Okay? Which is that if it becomes too crowded they die. And they start to die faster than this. So if you write down what is the, you know, if you, what, what does the add as a term in this equation, right, is, let me, let me erase that guy and write it like that. It adds a term, which is just the one that you get from there, which is rho times 1 minus rho over rho star, which is the logistic term that you get, okay? Mm -hmm. And I'm going to put, to get a bit of scales, I'm going to put, you know, that there is a rate that's alpha to, to not have, because I will need that. And so you just get a, an additional term here. So now the phenomenology becomes different, because this is at low, again, this is the law of large number. Because now what happens is that the particle can reproduce, okay? And so there's something interesting already that you can think about, is that they can go into regions by MIPS, but then if they are there, they might be unhappy and die, and then something can, interesting can happen. So I'm going to show you what happened. Can you turn the, the projector on? Should I turn this? Should I take the light to have like very, very pretty pictures? Okay, so what you see here, what you see here is what happened without the burst death. And this is coarse graining, like oil in water, except that's not the solution that you would get by the standard canyon equation, but the one that's right below. 
with this strange diffusion coefficient. So you start with something which is a little bit, you know, there's a bit of uh, the, the bacteria, the, there's fluctuation in densities of bacteria or swimming particles in the box, and then as you can see, they start to coarsen, and they do bubbles, that eventually, by also opening and all that, there will be only one drop that left, if the system size is finite. Okay? If the system size is infinite, it would be really Oswald opening, which is that is length scale, length scale but, but think about it as a system of bacteria, and that's what happened is only happened. Okay? Now, here is what that, so this is at mean field level. Now, another picture, and then, and then this is, so what I'm going to show you now is a movie where you have particles. So this is a, this is a simulation, it's quite easy to do. Tobias Graf could use that. You solve this as the E, right? So you have two ingredients. Each of these particles is a diffusion coefficient, and then I think it will be fairly apparent when you see the movie. Their population is no longer constant because they can. There is the burst death term that I showed you before. Okay. So if you see, here's what here's what you see. Poof! They make a cluster. They die. The density was low for a while. Then they swim. Okay. Then you know at some point <coughs> they will be the patients. <laughs> they will swim, they will swim, they will find each other, and then they get another cluster, and then it dies. And then it keeps going. And then probably, I don't know how long the movie is, but it will do another cluster, etc., etc. Okay? Mm -hmm. I want to explain this. I want to explain these things. Right? And that's something which is like, you know, this is the reason why, I mean, I, I know you, you're more interested, I mean, phase transition, like the previous one, I think that there are no fluctuations, but but, but if you look at experiments, especially at the micro scale, typically you have fluctuation. They are there, right? So that tells you that the mean field may be telling you, I think that we have started again, right? The mean field can tell you something, but really there are fluctuations here, I'd like to understand what they are. Okay. So with this guy, so now we need to understand the point. So I'm going to, there's a few more math formula, and then it's going to be, which is, I'm going to consider a case in which the particles swim fast compared to the rate of death or reproduction, right? They swim. And so there's, there's a time scale over which they swim, and there's a time scale where their population varies. So that means that there's a separation of time scale in the system, and so I can look at what happened well, when there's a separation of time scale, and that allows you to do the following thing, which is that you can think about the system will essentially find a fixed point given its current population, and then this population will slowly evolve. Okay? There is what's called a slow manifold. There are direction in phase space, which is where they, things go fast, and then they reach something where it gets slow, and you know, in the picture where you take the limit, it goes infinitely fast on this manifold, and then it just follows the manifold. Okay? So, of course, this is a manifold. So, what is this manifold? These are the fixed points. Of the so the equation that you have written here, this is just the can hilliard equation I told you about. This guy, this is the one that is, that is still probably apparent over there a bit. This is the term that happened from the rigorization that you have. So this is just looking at critical point, in fact, minimizer of the energy that's below. This is the rigorized energy. You look at the minimizer, and you say they go on the minimizer, and then I'm going to, okay. To be able to represent that, we can do it in any dimension if you want. I'm going to do it in one dimension with fixed boundaries, Neumann boundary. Why? Because then the particle typically want to go at one edge. Because that's the way you can, there's a surface tension, right? This exchange term. So the way to minimize the exchange term is to put everybody at the left or everybody at the right. In more complicated, you know, two dimension, more complicated geometry, you could have more stuff, and I'm going to show them to you, but you can do the analysis. So if you do it this way, what happens is that you can ask, what are the solutions of this equation if you parameterize them by rho bar, which is given, this, this is the, the evolution that is there without the birth, let's conserve rho. Okay? So I can fix a rho, the density of the system, and ask what are the fixed points, meaning what are the minimizers of the rigorized energy. And then I can vary my rho. Right? I can vary this value of rho, the mean density in the system, and I can see what happened. And what, for this system, there's something quite interesting, which explain in a minute what's going on in, in the movie, which is that what you get is that you get this very nice pitchfork bifurcation, 
subcritical, which is that what is shown here, I, I need to show you a, a representation of what the, 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 the solution do. So one way to do that is that this is the average density that you have, that I fix. And here is just some measure, which is to say whether there is more particle on the right or the left. So what you just do is that the average density is just the average from 0 to 1. That's 0 to 1. Right? This is the geometry. I go from 0 to 1. with, right? uh, And here what I do is that you just integrate rho or minus rho. You do the difference in half of the box. It's a counter. This guy right, can go from 1 to minus 1, depending if they are all at the left or all at the right. OK? If you, and so if you fix that, and you look at the, the minimizer of this energy, you see that there's only one minimizer which is at this value of rho that's stable. And then at some point, there's three that appear that are stable and two unstable. And at some point, there's only one unstable that remain and two stable. OK? And now, once I have obtained this equation, at mean field level, what I can do is I can say, well, I can try to write down, at least conceptually, I cannot, you can say, I can, the only thing that is now evolving on a slow time scale is the mean density of the particle in the box. Okay? And they're going to do that on this graph. <coughs> you can write down an equation, which is that this guy is the rho of x given the rho of t. And then using this form, which is a solution of that equation for this specific rho bar of t, you can average the equation as the equation. That's not very important. What's important is that if you do that, you end up having that there's three regimes with critical value. And I apologize here. I'll write it there in red so that, is that I, I, did the style, I didn't, didn't redo the styles. I mean, what is denoted as rho zero on the slide is what I call rho star a minute ago. It's the kind population, not the initial condition. Okay? It's rho star has become rho zero. So what happened is this. Uh, uh, so, so these two these two parameters that you get, right? Which is so. Th these are the points that correspond to these rows. If you vary the control parameter rho zero, which is the carrying population, if the carrying population is low, what you get is that there is only one stable state. And that's because the the system is essentially homogeneous. There is no clustering that happen. They are happy. That's because they are in the region essentially where this d effective is remain positive, so there's no clustering. If you increase it, at some point, you get a limit cycle. I'll show that to you. And then if you pass a certain other critical value, you get metastability, which is that there's two fixed points. The dynamics, either you get a cluster at the right or a cluster at the left. Okay? So let me explain that. So this one is clear. If you're in a region where you only have this branch, that's the only thing that can happen. Okay? What is interesting is what happens if you start to go in the branch that's there. And if you go in the branch that's there, I guess you need to try to you know, think about this here. The equation that you get, that's why I wrote it like that. This is the equation for the average row, the one that you have integrated. It contains two terms, one which is the average, and the other one which is the average of the square. That's the L1 and the L2 norm. Okay. And so what happens is that when a function becomes spiky, right? if a function becomes spiky, its L1 norm explodes, whereas its L2 norm can remain controlled. This makes sense? This guy, if I take this, this is an average of function. If the function is like you know, something which is fairly smooth, then its average and the average of the square may be pretty much the same thing. But if you <laughs> spike it, right? This guy can explode. This guy can explode, and this one not, right? I said the opposite. Because it's because if you average, the, think about the square of a Dirac, mm -hmm. right? The Dirac is normalized, but its square is not. Okay. And so what happened is that, what, what could happen is that this term could win over that one for a while, but when they are not spiked, but when they are spiked, it could be the, the other way. Okay, and that's what creates the limit cycle. So if you go, it's exactly what you can get. And that's the phenomenon that I showed you on the movie, which is that when it's on this branch, the system wants to increase its population. 
because this one wins. But as soon as it jump on this branch, which corresponds to putting them on one side of the box, suddenly it has spike there, and it, because it has spike, this turn start to win, so it wants to decrease its population. At some point, it could be that it reached the end of the branch, then it falls back on that one, and then it repeats. Okay? And you notice that there's another branch there, but if the motion is deterministic, at the beginning it will choose one and stay on it. That's a limit cycle. Right? Okay. These, by the way, in the system are in blue and in green, the two spike state that you get, where all the particles are there, all the particles are there. Right? And these are the critical value of which this happens. Okay, and then at some point, so this is the limit cycle that you see. That's solving the PDE. Right? You see what happens is that they all go there, then they start to da da and they all reappear. That guy is nothing but, you know, this is a coarse grain picture that I, because I did these averages, but if I look at the field, and I look at, you know, its density field, right, high density, low density, that's what it does. A blob, it disappears. A blob, it disappears. Okay? And this is, why does it do always that here? Well, it's because, this is mean field level again, it's because they always want to be at the boundary because there's less surface tension there. Okay? If you do the same thing, no, I will go do that. If you pass a certain critical point, then what you end up having is that there's two stable configuration and one unstable configuration in between. This will play the role. This will play the role of a critical nucleus in a minute. And these two guys are the ground states. Okay, which this is the ground state, this is the ground state. And in fact, the row S is that guy. It's like it takes a bit from this and a bit from the other one. Right, it's the one that's gone with this dash. Mm -hmm. okay. Now, all of this doesn't account for fluctuation. This is just a solution of mean field that I showed you. But of course, if you know account for fluctuation, you need to understand what's going on with fluctuation. Okay, so that's kind of, it's clear what, what happened, you know. Okay, so first of all, you can do a little, you know, phase diagram, which is, this is the row zero, and in fact, that's the value of the regularization parameter, and then you have a phase diagram where these are homogeneous new solution, the time theory, the limit cycle, and the one that you have two stable state, and there's like, you can define this, you know, where, just looking at stability. Now you can look at what happened with the noise. What happened with the noise now is that when it goes on this, and this is a quasi-homogeneous state. If you completely kill the fluctuation, it can only go back there because it's choose on this side. But if there isn't any amount of fluctuation past, at some point it could go on the other side. So it could go that instead of going there, it reappears there. So you can have something which is like this, where this is random, the side on which it appears, but the time remains exactly the same as before because it's just the time it takes to do that and then it's whether it will choose to go this way or that way. And each time it does it, it can essentially choose half out. So you go there and go there. If you do pay... If you have fluctuations, you don't need to, to wait until really the linear instability of the homogeneous state before jumping. If you have noise. If you have, yes. But if the noise is, that's right. So, so I mean, this is so still in the limit. This is still for no, noise that is fairly right. Otherwise, yes, it could be like for the movie I showed is probably in a regime which is wilder than this, right? If you do it with purely boundary condition, then the graph that I showed you with this pitchfork verification is not valid anymore because there's this uh, you know translational invariance. And then what you see is this: they appear at precise time. This is the equivalent of going along this orbit, but this orbit can change its position in space, which you can't see at that level, and so it appears a bit like that, okay? And if you do simulations, you can actually find this time. So this is, this is just the mean field, right, or, or the analysis. These are, these are particles in one, it's the same movie as the one that I showed last time, right, at the beginning, except this is 1D, and in 1D I can show you the particles and their density. And you see what happens. They are below the, you know, there they are below carrying capacity. And then at some point they make a blob where pretty much everybody in the blob is above the carrying capacity, so they all want to die. Then they all die, and say, pretty much not all, they go below carrying capacity, they start swimming again, and then they regroup. And it happens in a way which is, 
Okay? So that's that. And now, I still have five minutes, so I'm getting out of time. Uh, you are over time, but hot. Can I just finish the, the, yeah. the two styles? Then you can ask, what happens? No, if I, I go back to the non-periodic case, but it's generic, again, it's just to make pictures. What happens if I, I am in a situation where there are two stable states? Meaning, they're in a situation where the carrying capacity is so high that if ever they regroup in one side of the box, they are happy to be at that level and they don't want to die. Right? So then they could, in, in my 1D box, they could either go to the green state or they could go to the blue state, and if there was no noise, they would stay there forever. But if there is noise, eventually a fluctuation will push that state into that state. Yes? They will be like, you know, and this will be with some form of Arrhenius behavior, except that there is no energy here. There is no agrarian system. Remember, I forgot to say that. There was an energy when I looked at this, the thermodynamic mapping. But once I put the burst F, I have killed that feature, which should have been clear already from the fact that you cannot have limit cycle in a gradient system. Okay? And so, and I'm finishing to not kind of go completely overboard. You can ask, how is the orbit to go from one metastable state to the other due to noise? And so if you think, if you think the you know, equilibrium, you pick the saddle point and look at the orbit that descends from the saddle point on one side or on the other side. And you say, aha, the system will just go up to the saddle point and down. And this is the, the, the projection on this. But if you actually look at the, the minimizer, so if you look at the minimizer of the instant on equation that you can calculate numerically, we have designed method to do that, you see that the path that it takes is completely different. It goes the other way to go up. So going that way, which is the, the, the term if I reverse, it goes the other way, go to this point, and then there is going to be to go back. Okay? And, and this, this is, instead of doing this, which is that path, the, the light blue is that, time, space. What it does is this, completely different. In fact, it kills. It's not that the fluctuation where you have more bacteria that should have, there is less, and then it goes the other way. So it, it does this. Right? And of course, if you account for entropy, that's the last thing I say. This part is robust. But then this part, which is going downhill, and that's the, what Olivier was saying, if you have any amount of noise, you can fall off directly. But that doesn't really matter, because that's the part that takes action. That's the one that gives you the Arrhenius slow for the system. That's the one where you need to, the system needs to escape. So what you see is that. Instead of doing half of this, it just does that to go on the other side. OK? Sorry, I, I went a little bit, you know, a, a little bit too long. I apologize for that. Um, but th this is an illustration of what you can do with all this formalism in, in one system of interest, if you wish, which is to calculate these orbits and see what is the influence of the noise on long time in situation where you cannot compute the minimum energy path because there is no such thing. But there is the adrenic orbit. That's that's all I have for you today. Because at mean field level, it, even though you don't see it on the on the plot, it's not completely homogeneous. Okay. So in fact, even though you don't see it on the graph that I say, you're not complete. I mean, you're always above or below. Okay. Just, just, right. And so, and once you, I mean, it's deterministic, so it cannot, you know, it could do something which is a chaotic motion. That's true. But in this case, yeah, not yeah, that. Yeah, right? yeah. It could be. You're right. It could be chaotic. In this case, not that. It's just reproducing itself. So the formalism with H rho and theta indicates the math or mathematical physics. Yeah. When was it done and by who? Because you know, in physics, it's again it's something linear, like the government is zeros, but in, in the case of math, of our tradition, what time and by who? Is it completely under control? Or the same yes. sometimes that you, there were cases which were harder? So I, I mean, 
so, to, to be complete, so I mean, what I discussed here, and that's in the in the Dropbox, this approach, which is based on on what they call measured value Markov processes, that's really started by Dawson, and I, I put the notes, which is the original paper, because it remains very readable. Okay. Eighty-four. 85, something like that. Now, the large deviation principle at this level, I would have to find exactly where is the first reference where you would get these things. And probably if you look at rigorous results, you will not be able to do anything with ways that I have been doing here, which are kind of involved. Certainly not a row square. You, know, that's like, you would need to get typically rates that are bounded somehow. So, and I would have to find reference for that, that are, you know, I, I, I don't know. There are no other questions. Thank you again.